ready to hear the word. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 7. And we're going to read seven verses. Verses 31 through 37. Mark chapter 7 beginning with the 31st verse. You can follow the reading on the monitor to your right or left. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged him to place his hand on the man. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Let us pray. Oh God, amid all of the sounds that will fill the air in the next few moments, may the sound of your voice be the clearest. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Many years ago at the Lyman Beecher Lectures on Preaching at Yale University, Dr. Gardner Taylor, one of the Prince of Preachers, uh, a black preacher, who uh, was the distinguished pastor of the Concord Baptist Church in Brooklyn, New York. He had given a lecture, and afterwards there was a Q&A session, a question and answer session. And there was a, an eager uh, seminarian who stood up and asked Dr. Taylor, uh, Dr. Taylor, how many points does a good sermon need to have? Well, Dr. Taylor uh, took a few moments to reflect on that question, and he came back with that exquisite answer, at least one. <laughs> and then he went on to talk about how that uh, some sermons have too many points that there are, there's an overload of ideas and the people can leave confused. So I thought about that when I came to this scripture uh, this week. Um, you know, our passage here uh, quantitatively is very small, only seven verses, but qualitatively, there, there's any number of sermonic possibilities. I can come up with any number of sermons from this passage. Uh, take, for instance, um, where this took place. Uh, this is one of the few times that Jesus left his native land of Galilee and he went northwest to what was known as a pagan Gentile territory. And um, here was the astonishing good news that God was just as present and just as 
active on foreign soil as he was in that land that was given to the descendants of Abraham. Is it not reassuring that you cannot outdistance God? You cannot go anywhere in this world where God is not, where God is not present. You can't go anywhere without discovering that God has gone there before you. Now, you know, the old medieval theologians had a cumbersome word for that. They talked a lot about the prevenient grace of God. The prevenient grace of God, which means the grace that goes before. And uh, there's no locale on the face of the earth that is God forsaken. God is there. And the good news is sometimes we find ourselves in a foreign context. I certainly have with this coronavirus, have you not? We find ourselves in a foreign context and we feel lost and we feel alone but I'll tell you something, the God who is here with us will be with us no matter where we are. Amen? He is closer than the breath that we breathe. He is nearer than our hands and our feet. Oh, praise his holy name. So, yes, this scripture, which is, uh, it's a density of truth, and any responsible inter interpreter could unpack many points. Well, here's another one for you. We could spend the rest of our time talking about the way that Jesus responded to this particular individual. This man who was deaf and as a result couldn't speak, he was deaf and he was mute. You've heard me say before, and it won't be the last time you'll hear this, but I love quoting St. Augustine who said, God loved each person that he met. Jesus loved each person that he met as though there were none other in all the world. Uh, and he loves all as he loves each. He loves you as if there were none other in all the world to love. And he loves all as he loves each. So the love and mercy of Jesus is individualized in our passage. You know, Jesus never lost sight of the trees, uh, no matter how dense the forest was. Here is an example of how personal and how individual was his care. He comes to this man who is deaf and is mute. In other words, he's trapped in a prison of silence and isolation. I don't know about you, but I have kind of felt that way of late, trapped in a, in a place of isolation. <laughs> Jesus knew that he couldn't communicate with this man in the normal way. He couldn't communicate with words. So what did he do? He took this man aside from the crowd and he adapted his technique. He actually devised sort of a sign language. For instance, he took his fingers and put them in the man's ears to indicate that there was a problem there with his hearing. He took some of his saliva and put on the man's tongue, indicating that uh, that too was an organ that was not functioning. 
And then he looked up to the heavens in a, in a gesture of inviting divine energies into the situation. And then he, he lets out a sigh indicating that um, what has happened to this man matters to him. What has happened to him makes a difference to Jesus. And then he speaks that Aramaic word that made such an impression on everybody who heard it. Ephatha. Be opened. It's an Aramaic word. Be opened. And then the energies of God that years before had formed his ears and his tongue broke into that man's life and made those organs function properly. Is it not reassuring that the God who made us can mend us? Amen? The God who made us can mend us. And God is not just the creator from the beginning, but he continues to care for us. And hey, there is no brokenness that is too much for this ingenious mercy in Jesus. God can take the worst of things and make the best of things out of it. We can never break ourselves too much for God. You know, I believe that despair is presumptuous. And I've talked to a lot of people today who are, who are in despair. And I, I remind them that despair is presumptuous. It's, it's saying something about the future that we really don't have a right to say. We don't know what God is going to do. God can take our brokenness, our deafness, our muteness, and he can make something beautiful out of it. Amen? The God who made us can mend us. That's a tremendous sermon. But let me make one more to be reminded of Dr. Taylor's dictum that every sermon needs to have at least one point. Well, this is the point that I really want to make this morning. And if you don't remember anything else I say, this is what I want you to remember. I want to make a different kind of point here, which all hinges on a word that's found a couple of times in our text. It's the word they. They brought to Jesus a deaf man with an impediment of speech, and they begged Jesus to lay hands on the man. Now, who are the they? It's an unnumbered group of people that are not identified specifically. The miracle of this man's hearing coming back and his ability to speak, the miracle did not begin with his faith. This man did not take the initiative to make this miracle happen. Oh no, there were some people, some friends of his, who cared enough about this man to bring him to Jesus who could be the answer to this man's problems. The beginning of this healing, the beginning of this healing process is in the care and in the concern of other people.
Now, you could ask, now, where did these uh, pagan Gentile folk up in the, in the region of Decapolis, I mean, how did they know about Jesus? Where, how did they know to bring this man to Jesus the healer? Well, one intriguing possibility is that they knew of him because of another miracle that had taken place about a week before. You remember that man who made his home in the cemetery? We call him the Gathering Demoniac. Uh, he, he, he just went crazy, perhaps over his grief. Maybe he buried somebody there in the cemetery and just couldn't get away. It, it, you know, grief has that ability to shatter one's life. And Jesus got close to this man. Everybody else was afraid of him. Uh, the man was, was living in the tombs and he was cutting himself with stone. And Jesus got close to him and Jesus cast out the demons of despair, and restored this man to sanity. And the man was so grateful for what Jesus had done for him, he actually wanted to join the 12 followers of Jesus, the disciples of Jesus, and go across the Sea of Galilee with them and be a follower of Jesus. But Jesus said, no, no. I think what you should do is you should... Go back home. Go back to your people and tell them this good thing that God has done for you. And do you know where home was for this fella? It was the region of Decapolis, the same place where this particular miracle that we read about took place. So it could be, it could be, that the man who lived among the tombs, maybe it was his word and his witness that led those people to bring this deaf and mute man to the healer. We don't know that for sure, but there's one thing we do know. They loved this man enough to do something for him. You know, the opposite of love is not hate. You know, there is still in despising an element of vitality. No, the opposite of love is not hate, but indifference. Indifference. Not giving a fig what happens to somebody else. Of all the diseases of the human spirit, indifference is the worst. Didn't Jesus say, I was hungry and you didn't feed me? I was thirsty and you didn't give me anything to drink. I was naked, and you didn't clothe me. The opposite of the divine is indifference. These people in this passage, I'll tell you, they were on the side of angels. They cared enough about this man who was deaf and mute to bring him to one who could help. And you know something? Here is something that we all can emulate. We don't have the power to heal people in and of ourselves, but we can suggest to people that there is one who can heal and help, and his name is Jesus. We can do something to open the possibility that their problems 
and the mercies of Jesus might be brought together to care enough for people to suggest that Jesus can help, Jesus can save, Jesus can heal, Jesus can deliver. That's something we can do. I've always been intrigued by Gert Bahana's testimony. Gert Bahana had a father who was a very successful businessman in New York, New York City, but he was a dedicated agnostic, which meant that Gert uh, grew up with material affluence, but spiritual poverty. And she said that she had never seen a Bible until her adult life. And it happened to be the Gutenberg Bible, which was under glass in a museum in Germany. Well, she was married three times, each of her marriages ending in devastating divorce. She gave birth to two children that she wasn't capable of handling, and they brought a lot of grief into her life. So what did she do? She turned to drugs. She turned to alcohol as a way of escape, and that only deepened the problems that she had. She was so utterly, her life was so utterly unmanageable that she decided the only way out was to take an overdose of pills and then she thought she would go into what she thought was the darkness of non-existence. Well, you can imagine how she must have felt when several hours later she woke up in the intensive care unit of the hospital. She said, you know, I, I wasn't even capable of taking my own life. She was in absolute despair. Then a couple of nights later, she had some friends who came to the hospital to visit her. They pulled up a chair next to her bed so that they could talk with her. And as the conversation went on, one of her friends said, you know, Gert, have you ever thought of inviting God into your life to help you? You don't seem to be able to help yourself. And she said, oh, you make God sound like a bellhop. Just snap your fingers and he'll carry your bags for you. And they said, well, you know, that is one way of looking at it. We have found that God has that kind of humility and mercy. And she said, I'm not interested. Religion is just a crutch. And they said, well, you know, when you've got a broken leg, a crutch is a good thing to have. And with that, the conversation kind of ended, and eventually they went on. And deep into the night, she began to reflect on the things that her friends had told her. And all of a sudden, she did something that she had never done before, never entertained the thought of doing such. She looked up and she said, God, I don't even know if you're real. But if you are, if you are, I beg you to come and help me. I'm in a real predicament. I'm at the end of my rope. Well, just after saying that, she reported that all of a sudden there was a gentle light that began to move toward her. And there was an image of light at the foot of her bed that she 
identified as Jesus. She recognized it was Jesus. And she said for about 20 minutes, she was bathed in an affection, in an unconditional love, in a forgiveness, the likes of which she had never experienced. And it came to her that in spite of her past, she had a future. So in the middle of the night, she picked up the phone and she called her business manager. And she said, listen, first thing in the morning, I want you to come to the hospital and bring me a Bible. And he was so astonished and he said, my God, what has happened to you? And she said, my God has happened to me. And that was a huge turning point for her. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. Uh, those of you who uh, are in alcoholic recovery uh, may have heard of her, Gert Bahana. She went around the country telling what God's grace had done for her, and she spoke hope into hopeless lives. And it all started not because of her initiation. No. It all began because she had some friends that cared enough about her to suggest to her that she might bring her neediness to Jesus, who could help her. That's where it began. You know, there is really little that we can do to each other. We don't have the right or the power to break into uh, another person's life and inject ourselves like a, a shot of penicillin. But there is much that we can do with them, we can share our experience. We can, can be the catalyst uh, to, to, to pose the possibility that there is grace to help in time of trouble and invite people to draw close to Jesus, the healer. We're capable of doing that. You don't have to have a PhD in theology to do that. You don't have to have scriptures memorized to do that. You can just simply, honestly, caringly tell other people what you have experienced of the grace of God and invite them to open up to that great mystery. We all can do that. Bringing people to Jesus is our high and holy calling. So that brings me back to what I said at the very beginning. Every sermon needs to have at least one point. And that's my point today. If you, don't, if you don't remember anything else that I have said, remember this. You, by your care for somebody else, might be the one to set the stage for Jesus to do his healing, saving work. Isn't that wonderful? That's what I want to do with my life, and I know, I just know, it's what you want to do with yours. Amen and amen.